Hello and welcome to the fourth webinar from Govern With This Year as part of our High Functioning Board series. Today, as we've advertised, we're talking about the eight best practice strategies to prevent cyber attacks. But we're going to go so much deeper today and we have brought in one of Australia's leading cyber security consultants to help us unpack all the issues for our community and to watch out for what is around the corner my name is Wes Ward, if you don't know. I'm from Govern With. I'm the intensely curious governance moderator who will be hosting today and interjecting with questions on behalf of our audience. If you do have any questions today, pop them in the chat. And if we have time, we'll address them throughout today's one hour session because we really want a deep dive. So drop them in the chat. Adrian is in the background. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Each month, we have Fee Mercer, the founder and CEO, our governance expert, to join us on our presentations. But I'm very pleased to announce that we have David Ruddock from Solar Security today on the call, which is very exciting to have you. David, welcome today and thank you for attending. Thanks, Wes. It's, it's, really, it's really good to be here. I'm really excited. It's going to be a fun day today. We're going to make sure it's a lot of fun. We're going to loosen things up. But before we dive into that, here is a a little bit about David's background. He is CEO of CFC Security and Solus. It is a dedicated cyber response firm. He's got a background in building up in this industry, and he's got a lot of acronyms around his education, which <laughs> I know for a fact relate to cybersecurity, but it'd be a lot easier if you just shared your story with us today. David, for the benefit of the audience, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, for sure. The, the acronyms are fun, but uh essentially I started a business called Insane Technologies in January 2000 at the ripe old age of 22. From that point in time, I've been working with small to medium businesses and small to medium enterprise, trying to understand technology and cyber risk and helping them build a set of controls that are relative to their business need, their risk profile and their budget. I was really lucky that in April 2021, my business was acquired by a global insurer who has a major product line in cyber called CFC. And as of 18th of, the, of October last year, we're actually rebranded from Insane to Solace. And there's now an office in the US, the UK and Australia and about 100 of us working within the Solace side of the business. For my sins, I'm now CEO of CFC security in Australia. I wear two hats. One is Solus, which is the one we'll be talking mostly from today, where we're a cyber advisory, proactive cybersecurity, digital forensics, and incident response service business. But then also for CFC's customers, we represent ourselves as CFC response to provide them with incident response services when they have a claim. And through that, we see about 2,500 incidents a year, which I think gives me a really good insight into the reasons why cyber incidents occur. It's very much a vision that I don't think a lot of cybersecurity people, if they're not dealing with incidents, get to experience. But the end result of that, and this is the reason I'm really excited to be here, is I'm actually really passionate about educating boards, managers, business owners on what they need to know to understand this dark art that has become cybersecurity. So thanks for the opportunity, Wes. Wonderful. And out of those 2,500, are you are they just purely Australia or are you getting an eye <laughs> on trends overseas in the US, North America and Europe? Yeah, the US gets the bulk of them, followed by the UK and then Australia. But uh, we still get the threat intelligence from the US team. It's really quite interesting. Wonderful. Let's unpack that today. I'm super excited. So thank you again for joining us. Now, of course, every month we have our governance guru, the founder and CEO of Govern With, that's Fee Mercer. Fee, we introduce you a lot in this sort of format each time, but let's run the dance. Let's let you share your story in the next 90 seconds. Thanks, Wes. Well, welcome everybody and a particular big welcome to you, David. And David, I'm a bit like you, an entrepreneur, but at the other end of my life. And that doesn't matter. I think we both have these absolute passions. And my absolute passion is to support boards 
to be high functioning continuously, no matter what the circumstances. And the area that I've chosen to be an expert is around board review and development. And what we have the privilege of discovering, David, is just what are the latest trends that our boards and directors and executives need to focus on because they are their top risks. And by being able to have that identified to us from our evaluation with them data, we're then able to work with experts such as you to help shine a light on this, to help them be able to set the right strategies for this and then mitigate the risks around those strategies not being implemented. So I am so excited to have you here today because we've identified this as a big risk. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the perfect segue into our agenda. But when you talk about the data that you're privy to and we are privy to, Fee, let's unpack that. And to give this context, this was a chart from late last year. It was the biggest cap director capability gaps. Now, some people on the call may have seen this in previous instances before, but just briefly, this sets the tone for today's webinar fee. Could you just tell us quickly a little bit? Certainly, Wes. So, David, what we do in our business is we assist the boards to evaluate themselves from a board governance perspective, but also from the individual director capabilities perspective as well, which is that skills matrix piece. We added these contemporary questions early last year because we could see that these areas that used to be um, regarded by the board as something that management was in charge of, such as cyber security, are now becoming the real area that the board need to lead on. And much to our amazement, we discovered that this through our board governance evaluations, we put these contemporary questions under risk and through our skills matrix, these are the areas of the least skills of the directors and the least known about by the board as to what are we doing in the organisation. And what we have noticed is that these are going to cause disproportionate issues for a negative impact on our boards and our organisations if we don't address them. Wonderful, Fee. That sets us up for today and our agenda. And obviously, we've broken it down as we normally do into three bite-sized chunks. But today's about communicating that cyber risk to the board. We're going to roll through that now, then look at some of the challenges and a case study from the aged care sector. So strap in, everyone. We're going to talk about the blindingly obvious here, Fee. This is now not an IT issue. Absolutely, Wes. It, this is cybersecurity is a board responsibility. And this always seems to happen in governance that um, there are our regular corporate governance responsibilities. Of course, there is our sector specific governance responsibilities, such as in health, clinical governance. But cybersecurity is irrelevant as the sector you're in. Except, having said that, Wes, it is. <laughs> There are certain sectors that we work with where they are the most targeted, such as health uh, exactly. and what have you, because of the content, the data about their clients that they have. So it's a very high risk and it is now very much the responsibility of the board. And that's important because when boards ask questions about the things that they know are the top risks, that creates activity about that particular thing in the organisation. And that's why it needs to sit with the board. Absolutely, Fee. Now, this was a collaborative effort with David. I think this is one of the most important slides that we'll see today about communicating, getting the language right between an IT department and the board. There, there's a lot in this, David. Can you help us get underway? Yeah, it's... Uh... The biggest thing here, and I've been doing presentations on cybersecurity risk for close to eight, nine years now, but the problem we have is my kin, the IT folk, the propeller heads, as I've been called in the past, and I'm happy to wear that hat. The way in which we've communicated has not been the way a board understands what we're asking. And so we'll run in 
we need this new backup system, we need this new firewall, we need this, we need that. And we get asked, but why? And we all have these technical reasons, but it's not a reason the board understands. And as a byproduct, the budget, which is what we're trying to get our hands on, has never been made available to us. In the last couple of years, which we'll talk about in a second, we've obviously seen a massive change in the cyber landscape in Australia. And all of a sudden, budgets are loosening up, but we're still not communicating in a way where businesses really know, are we spending in the right place? Are we allocating the right resources to the right things? And are we actually lifting up our status quo? And I and as we discussed, it, it is a communication issue. Like, how do we get the IT department and the board to communicate on a similar level? I know debates have been said, so does the board need to learn cyber? And I don't think that's the case. I think it's more, we're talking risk. We, we are ultimately talking risk. This is a discussion, whether you call it kinetic or physical, that businesses have already looked at. We just need to have a way of doing that, that the board can look at and go, oh, I, I get that. And the IT team or the cybersecurity team can feed into. And I think it's also important, David, that when they're asking for more resource, more budget, the language onus is also on the IT executive to translate that into the language of risk. Yes, 100%. And, and not the language of technical tools or widgets. And yeah. it's a two-way street, don't you think? Oh, 100%. At the end of the day, the board doesn't care what the widget is, right? Like they yeah. just want to know, is it going to make me money? Is it going to save me money? Are we mitigating risk, minimizing risk, all those sort of things. And I have myself tried to sell things based on how good the widget is and learned that that's not a language the business cares about. But yeah, I'm excited that we're going to be talking about that today. Absolutely. We certainly will. Let's talk about part of this problem. Now, we have touched on this in last month's webinar in terms of the brands, but you're unpacking it deeper. And that's what you're here for, to talk about the, you know, the circumstances briefly around these three incidents because people are familiar with it but they may not really know what was going on underneath can you help us out here yeah of course almost everyone i know has been affected by one of these three if not more of these incidents they're the three biggest cyber incidents in australia and new zealand history as far as we can amend this particular slide is from a very smart friend of mine i can't take credit for it but what it's actually doing is breaking down all the aspects of what happened in each of these cyber events. But if we take all of that to the side, there is actually some fundamentally simple reasons why these events occurred. And, and take Medibank out for the moment, because we haven't actually got the report out of APRA yet, or I haven't seen it yet, which actually tells us what the root cause was. But with Optus, there was an open it's called an API application programming interface, but basically there's an open thing that allowed the threat actor to gain access. That was a change management process problem. So it, when you unpack it, it's actually a really simple cause. As for latitude, it looks like from the reports we're seeing in the media, that was a supply chain attack. Uh, these are things that we see in, in our incidents over and over again, that it was someone left something open Security's hard. We often make changes because something's not working in the business and the business has to run. And so we'll open up something to gain access to it. And the business runs at a million miles an hour. We'll never get back to it. But the point of showing these three is that everyone would look at these businesses and go, well, these guys have probably an unlimited budget for cybersecurity. And if they have an unlimited budget for cybersecurity, how is it they still got hacked? Is it because they are the best target or is it just because they had low hanging fruit? And statistically, we find that the threat actors are lazy and they are looking for the low hanging fruit. So if these guys can get hacked with an unlimited budget, what does a small to medium business, a small to medium enterprise got a chance of with a much tighter budget? Yeah. But there are ways. David, you've just preceded my question beautifully about low hanging fruit. I didn't have enough time to put a slide in dedicated to this, but I'll preface it by saying that if people on the call today 
aren't doing some of the basics that we talk about and what we would refer to the low hanging fruit, someone's going to pick it first, whether yeah. it's you as the audience, the director, the chair, or the cyber criminal, someone's got to move first. And I think we've got to keep that in the back of our mind, don't you think, as a way to think about the business as usual? Yeah, correct. It, honestly, it's not all the complex exploits and yep. all this stuff that we see in the media that causes cyber incidents. Yep. It's simple basics that usually result in, in, in a hack. So let's hang on to that theme, everyone, because who moves first wins in this area. Okay, just to quantify the impact of that, we touched a little bit on this last month, David, in terms of the legal cost, but there, there's other factors to consider when you are hacked. Yeah, so if you end up having unauthorized access to sensitive customer records, you know, the Privacy Act in Australia requires you to notify. There's a whole heap to unpack there, so I won't go too deep. But previously, when we used to talk about cyber risk and warning people it could have a negative PR problem, all the stats we used typically were American. And so a lot of businesses in Australia would not pay as much attention to it. But now, over the last year, we now have some really hard numbers. And, and we've seen in the media, 10% of Optus customers might leave. We know that there's a cost to replace passports now. And that yeah. means you can do some simple math to try and work out what could an incident to your business cost. If you've got a million records and they have passports on them, that's going to be $193 million in replacement costs. So it, we're now starting to be able to quantify actual costs that are relative to Australian businesses, which helps with that discussion about risk. Absolutely. And we spoke, touched on it a little bit last month in terms of the legal costs. But when we really start to talk about the non-IT cyber risks fee, that these are squarely at board level. Let's just quickly remind and unpack again. Exactly. Reputation, it's really interesting with um, we work with the education sector and Aon, who's one of our partners, does a risk review questionnaire every two years with the education organizations the independent schools and um right up until last year number one risk has been reputation of course last year workforce and what have you took over so why is reputation related to cyber risk if you are looking after this incredibly important data that relates to your families, your students, in the case of hospitals and aged care, your beautiful residents, your consumers, and you can't protect that from the open market or from people discovering things that you thought were private about yourself, your reputation is going to be in tatters. And that immediately and long-term has a significant impact on your balance sheet. And even though you might say in hospitals, we just have so many people wanting to come in, we're, we're never at risk. You are at risk. Reputation also is about whether people want to work for you or not. And given that workforce is the other massive risk that we all face, you want a reputation for your consumers and your customers and your students and your families and communities, but you want it for your workforce as well. David, there's a really interesting story when you talk about it, some of the most terrible governance disasters that have happened. And you think of Rio Tinto hmm. blowing up 40,000 year old land sites sacred land sites, and the biggest impact of all was their staff were so ashamed they actually won't wear their Rio Tinto T-shirts anymore and don't like to tell people who they work for and have been looking for other jobs. Negative brand equity. Yeah. So that's core business disruption, one of the biggest preventers of being able to run our businesses at the moment is our workforce. And I think also, Fita, I can think of two examples, and you mentioned one yesterday, David, about core business interruption. We spoke last month about New, Newcastle Grammar Hack and that they couldn't physically open the gates. Like mm. so, people, students couldn't come to school. We've spoken about a hospital that couldn't 
had to postpone elective surgeries. So core business was run to a standstill. I think you, you mentioned one yesterday, David, in another sector as well, where they just had to stop issuing scripts, I believe. Yeah, it was a, it was actually an aged care facility. Oh, okay. yeah. We'll talk about that one yeah. later. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. But uh, it's just so important to understand that, especially based on the information from Aon we shared last month, that the healthcare sector is the number one most valuable data on the dark web. So in terms of the value of the information our audience is custodians of, it's the most prized. So it's really worth understanding the realization of the industries we're in. Fee, we talk about models, frameworks in all areas of governance, but also we've got, we're about to have help from David talk about cybersecurity frameworks. Exactly. And all good things, David, when they become a top risk and the board need to be leading on this top risk, the most important thing is that we actually need to have some risk mitigation strategies. And the first good money spent is around building good frameworks that describe how do we manage this cybersecurity risk across the organisation? And importantly, how do we educate and train from the ground up just simple behaviours that disallow things to be open? But importantly, David, that framework needs to go to our third-party providers as well. Absolutely. Let's dive into this. This is the meat and potatoes of the webinar. But David's brought together not only what we're going to talk about now, which is the essential eight, but a whole new framework as well that can really open up the dialogue of discussion at every board level member on this call. So David, fire away about the essential eight. What's its origins, its backgrounds? It is an Australian framework, I believe. Yeah, so it actually started in what's called the Australian Signals Directorate, which is the the spy organization for Australia that deals with digital assets, so communications. And it's based on the eight security controls or the top eight security controls that the ASD has seen that would reduce the likelihood of, I think, 87% of the cyber attacks that they see. It's now part of OSCyber, sorry, not OSCyber and the ACSC, but it talks about eight physical, sorry, eight technical controls that you can implement. And it's very popular in defence and government, obviously, since it comes out of a, a defence-based organisation already. But it does provide a really good framework. The problem we find, even though it's become very popular off the back of these big breaches to talk about the essential eight, is that for a lot of commercial enterprises, implementing all of the controls in the essential eight for a, a normal business is actually quite difficult. And so within the E8, we talk about a maturity level of zero through three, zero being I have nothing, three being I may as well be Fort Knox. Um, sometimes for businesses just to get to a level one on a couple of them, particularly application control, it is near on impossible. So it's a good framework. I think with the recent media, it's become very popular. But it also misses out on some of the basics that I think some businesses should think about first before they start investing in leveraging this as a framework, which is why I, I suggested we also have a consideration towards the other one. Yeah. David, why is it so difficult? Yeah. So application control or application allow listing, as it's referred to, is basically a process where Every single program you want to run on your computer has to be approved. It's a deny by default. And I can tell you, we do implement E8 for a lot of our clients, but it's a transition. All of a sudden, you've got staff who can't just go and install stuff themselves. And that becomes something that the board, the management, et cetera, have to, they have to manage that expectation because staff for a very long time have had kind of a free-for-all. And we find that in some organizations, if the top level doesn't have enough buy-in on this, 
implementing that particular control gets thrown out the window because they just don't want to deal with the complaints. And it's not that it's a bad control. It actually would stop a lot of things. But when you have a business that just wants to run and just wants to sell or just wants to service their customers, security can't get in the way of that. So there are other controls that sort of meet close when application control is not suitable for that business. David, if I was a chair or director and I'm facing this cultural issue on the ground within my workforce and we're trying to do or implement essential aid, what some of the strategies you've seen that have worked, even though it's quite difficult even to get to level one, what's some of the approaches that, uh, you know, directors canvassing this issue? Yeah, yeah, look, that's a really good question, Wes. I'd probably say cybersecurity awareness training for the board down, and that means the board has to turn up to the training as well so that they understand. But using cyber awareness training not as much to teach people not to click on things, that's a great outcome, but actually to get their engagement and buy-in as to why cybersecurity is so important. We're talking about aged care, we're talking about health, we're talking about schools. There's a lot of staff who maybe they're not tech savvy, um, mm -hmm. maybe they see this as getting in the way of their job. I've had the I don't want an application on my phone because the school will monitor me or the healthcare provider will monitor me. And we've got to get them to understand that we're not actually trying to interfere with their life. We're not interfering with their job. We're trying to actually protect their customers and the business. As you said before, for, you know, there's a big PR and a bottom line consideration here, but we've got to get buy-in from the board. And if we get in the board, we can get through it. And I find awareness training with a focus on engagement and buy-in is actually the best technique for that. Wonderful. And Fee, to that point, it, you know, the awareness training really is critical from a, a governance and board level perspective, because it's not about having the answers to cyber, not doing cyber security courses, but being informed enough to ask the questions, don't you think? Absolutely. It's so true, Wes. It's asking the right questions. And it's and it's important at a board level to ask, to, to learn enough about something at a strategic level so mm -hmm. that you can ask strategic questions as opposed to accusatory questions. Yeah. The questions like, why the hell haven't we got anything done about our cyber is not helpful. But a strategic <laughs> question along the lines of, what are our strategies and what do we have in place? And what is the way that we mitigate the risk with our third party providers? is the perfect sort of questions and yeah. then give executive time to work through this and come back to you i think david's point earlier was a really good one it is about taking your time and actually not making this overly complicated absolutely we did promise that we'll be delivering the essential aid but we've gone one better and david's now introducing us to what's called the nist framework let's walk through this because i think back to the 90s david when there were a lot of countries out there that were thinking about upgrading their telephone system and because of the maturity of the mobile network they leapfrogged landlines and went straight to mobile as an analogy this may be an opportunity for our audience to consider leapfrogging essential eight if it's along your line of thinking and diving straight in here because I know for a fact that we've been talking about the practicality of NIST as a result. So let's unpack this entire National Institute Standards Framework. Yeah, it, as you said, it, it's developed by the United States NIST organisation. It's based on existing standard guidelines and practices and it's designed to break down the different components of cybersecurity into five different categories and five subcategories and the reason i like this a lot is a a lot of these map across to things like ea iso 2701 which is a cybersecurity framework and a number of the other frameworks, there is actually direct mapping for a few of them. So it's a really good starting point, whether you're trying to take a journey into um, ISO certification or Essential 8 compliance. 
but also a lot of vendors are now leveraging the language of the NIST CSF to help them describe how their product or service aligns with a particular category or subcategory. So you might buy, if we stick back to the application control aspect, it might align in the protect aspect of the system. There might be something that also talks about the identify, which is identifying a person, object, or device. Or it might talk to the recover process, which might be developing an incident response plan or having a particular backup strategy in place. And this, I feel, is really good language that we can all come together on. I think, David, would you find, as an IT professional interfacing with boards on a regular basis, do you think that if a board had this slide, it was part of their board papers, it would help create that common language between IT executive and the board, they could talk around this document as a tool, as a device to get the conversation going and be able to understand the categories and that value chain around cyber? Yeah, hundred percent. If you, Even if you just look at it, yeah. there are certain things in there where the board could be saying, okay, and to Fee's point, what are we doing with regards to our detection process or our maintenance or governance that they're words that the boards can use to have those teams respond in and say okay we're not actually doing anything there okay should we be doing something there is that a risk to our business and there are other frameworks that feed into this as well that help businesses understand where they should try and invest aligning with these categories i think it's a wonderful framework and As a result, we do have a question that's come in. Are we getting a copy of the PowerPoint presentation? And the answer is yes. It'll be supplied with the replay. We're very committed to everyone's success in the community to getting this right. And I think this is one of the most valuable tools we can use and share, and we will. Just to let everyone know, we will be sending a copy of the PowerPoint. Now, fantastic, David. Thank you. Let's talk about, just quickly, you've touched on it, but just to reiterate the points, it is a US framework, but it really does talk to those at a high level to the subcategories of standards, guidelines, and practices. Yeah. And it's it actually, one of the functions which is is geared around actually helping talk at a board level too. So it is designed for both a technical and a higher level evaluation just a fantastic communication device. So Fee, when we're talking about why, and we see this, we've seen it in our data, and we speak anecdotally, we see evidence here and there, what's going on. We're really boiling it down to some of just the basics, aren't we? Exactly. So David, in our world, um, we talk about director capabilities, and there's two things. Some risks or some areas of capability, you want all directors to have a a proficient level of understanding or knowledge. And if you're talking about health, that would be clinical governance, things like that. And what we've discovered is that there is a a low level of capability around cybersecurity. But as you said, we don't want everybody going out and suddenly becoming a cyber expert or what have you. But what we do want to do is build people's capabilities from that foundation level of understanding to a proficient level of understanding. And the main reason is because your job at a boardroom table is to smell risk when it passes you at the boardroom table. And then you have to ask a wise and strategic question about that. And what can happen when the opposite applies is that we're not asking the right questions, we're not driving the right activity. And so what we've discovered is that this is a whole greenfield area here. There is no real cyber model in governance at the moment, despite the fact that it's presented itself. And I think it's presented itself again quite quickly as a really big problem. So, yeah, this is a what I regard as an exciting opportunity, actually. And this is one of the reasons why we're deep diving so 
deep mm. and extended into cyber because it's emerging, it's evolving by the day. And like you say, there are no cyber models. We're presenting some here today for the audience, but it's really important to know that once again, think about the low hanging fruit. If it's sitting there, whoever moves first is going to win and let's make sure it's our community. So I'm just going to move to the similar slide to unpack those points, David. Let's talk about why failure exists. Yeah. Um, as I said at the start, I've been talking to business owners and managers about cyber as a risk since I think it was 2016, 2017. The problem I always had is all of the things related to overseas businesses. And unfortunately, what I noticed is until it happens to someone or is close enough to home, we have this she'll be right, mate, sort of attitude. And the example we were talking about the other day, I did some work for a local real estate agent who had been hacked. And as a byproduct of him being hacked, he invited me along to his principal's meeting and everyone was engaged because it was someone they knew. For better or for worse, I think finally the the three men incidents we mentioned before are bringing that to the focus. But we've got to get people from going from a very reactive perspective. Everyone's much better cyber secure after an incident. Yeah. But the impact of having a cyber incident is massive for your business and for your customers. The other one is, as I said, and it's skipping the basics. And, and whether you're going for cyber insurance or you're just after making sure you are not that low-hanging fruit, all the time when we have cyber incidents that we investigate, particularly when they're an email compromise, the mailbox in question didn't have multi-factor authentication or the remote server didn't have MFA on it. And when we say to the business, okay, what's going on there? We find out that they were midway through a, an implementation project, but hadn't got across the line as just get on with it. Stop dragging your feet. Information governments, we're talking about what do you store? When do you store it? Those three breaches we're talking about, we're storing data for too long. Businesses tend to store things for much longer than they need because storage is cheap. And then that final part is like anything in your business, whether it's OHS or fire drill, you have to have a plan and you have to practice it. Yeah. And if you don't have those things, um, I can tell you if you have to call me because you got hacked. It is an extremely stressful situation. People don't know what they're experiencing. They don't know how it's going to work. And I, we're always very good at making it less stressful for them, but I'd really love people to actually get in there and go, this happened, but we have a plan and be prepared. And I think it's also part of that preparation. It's not necessarily a, a technical response either. There's boardroom discussions about do we pay a ransom or not? How does that affect our image, our brand, our reputation? Do we have the financial resources to execute that payment? And then the question is, do we even know, will the cyber criminal honour that transaction? These are some of the, what I'd call non-IT issues to be considered. And also on password phrases, I just wanted to highlight we run through an exercise on our insight session. We did it last week with one of the, our aged care community members. And it just, it's an easy, low hanging fruit exercise to, we know, especially from Michael Prant from last month, that many organizations won't be insurable or covered if they don't do these basics very well, like passwords, David. You'd be seeing this all the time. Banks, banks won't honor or repay money that when the basics aren't done well. Yeah. And also on the password thing, there are databases, and Michael talked about this as well, online where billions of the most commonly used passwords are available for bad actors to use in their activities. And when we do an investigation, we always reverse people's passwords using those lookups. Mm -hmm. And the amount of times we see things like holiday one, two, three, and it's atrocious, but we all did it at one point in time because you don't yeah. know what you don't know. And that's why we educate so that people go, oh, now I understand why that's not the right thing to do. Because you've got a front row seat on that, David, when you do see an incident, you 
that you're down there at the coalface, what proportion of those incidents would correlate to that database? So we're talking 50% or higher in terms of those really bad passwords? Yeah, it's usually higher. A lot of the, and everyone always thinks that it's some complex way that the bad actor got in, but it's yeah. usually they guessed a password. It's usually something like a vendor, maybe it's the copier vendor with username copier, um, had a very simple password and had too much access. As I said at the start, it's low-hanging fruit. It's really simple stuff. Threat actors are lazy and we keep leaving the door wide open for them. We also advertised in the promotion of this webinar about bring your own devices. And I think it talks a little bit to the discussion where we had about the Essential 8 installing applications, making from a recipient or user point of view, potentially harder to do their job. But we've really got to understand what this category of workforce and cyber where it intersects, David, we've really got to unpack this and understand because the board's it's great in theory, but we've got to make it practical. Yeah. So the work from home model, the BYOD, bring your own device model, has been around for a long time. COVID obviously was a super force for that. And we now live in a world of, of very hybrid staff. And coming back to the buy-in from the board and, and everything else, the challenge we have, which I don't think a lot of business owners, managers, board directors understand is... If I'm using my personal computer to access your company data, you have no visibility as to what I do with that data once it lands on my device. If I, if my home device, if I've got kids and they download bad games and those games put an infection on the computer and they steal my password or they steal copies of some of the data I, I took off to work on, yep. it's gone. And so we always recommend a business implements a computer security policy and a bring your own device policy. And the reality is if someone wants to use their own device to access your business, you should have stuff on there to monitor that device from a security perspective. And we do get pushback from staff who say, I don't want you monitoring what I'm doing. Um, most of us have too much on our plate to be monitoring every single website they view anyway. But the reality is if you want to use your own device, that's the cost of using your own device. And the same goes with working from home. We do have to have visibility of that device. Otherwise, the business loses control once it leaves the perimeter of the business. Where we used to have those controls in place at the physical bricks and mortar. And I'd come back to the awareness training is that will help you get buy-in from, from your team that it's okay. And as I said, the security folk are not monitoring what you're doing all day, every day. We've got much better things to do. And to that point, Fee, we're starting to touch on cultural issues. And if the board is responsible for driving culture and that awareness training, that trickle down may help the IT executives in their technical remit to strengthen that, those policies. What are your thoughts around that and the cultural aspects? One of the quickest and most effective things any board can do is to help lead on culture. And the moment staff see the board doing things, the board advertising that they're doing or having in someone around cybersecurity training or actually attending it with the staff and actually asking questions with the staff to the trainers it is that simple. It's You're really lucky as a board member how easy it is to lead on culture. Again, as David's been saying, it is not rocket science, but mm. it's a matter of being there and it's a matter of being seen. And that immediately puts up the flag to everyone, this is important. Yeah, it sends a very strong message just by mm. your presence, exactly. And it's yeah. really that old wax on, wax off, Mr Miyagi, doing the basics super well at each stage. Now, one of the other challenges, we've touched on it with Latitude, but just understanding this supply chain issue, David, this is a slide from last month, but 
I don't think we can underscore the vulnerabilities there because we all use software these days as a productivity tools across every industry, across every business, in every role. The threats are there, aren't they? Yeah, and it, I've done some talks for various school groups as well because they, there are certain platforms that schools or aged care or whoever are using as part of their business. And I always ask the question, okay, have you asked the supplier how they protect you from a cybersecurity perspective. And we're so used to buying software or buying services. That's not really a consideration. But yeah, off the back of Latitude, I think there was Frontier, which is a big payroll system that affected a lot of big businesses. Even if you look at things like Myob or Zero for smaller businesses, we're all subscribed to something. What is the impact to our business if that something gets attacked? The other side of it too is what if one of the technology partners that we work with, whether it's their managed service provider, external security team, whatever, what if they get hacked? What happens to your business there? And as a business, we've got to start being a little bit more careful about who we engage um, and, and qualifying them. Do they even have cyber insurance? If they get hacked, are the costs to repair and going to be covered? Or are you going to be the one in the hole? So there's a whole consideration and we're seeing more and more because businesses aren't getting, some businesses aren't getting better at protecting and not being that low hanging fruit. Yeah. The threat actors are actually looking up the chain and saying, okay, how can we cause more damage? Who can we attack that will allow us to multiply our, our effect? And it's still worth reminding that health sector data is the most valuable patient data on the dark web. And we've got a question, David. It's more for next month, but we're talking about whether there's an insurance payout or an entity has to pay out to hackers. Um, How is it not trackable? My immediate thinking was that they're probably paid out in Bitcoin that is untrackable and it's all in the dark web. Is is that how these transactions normally occur? Yeah, it's all done usually through Bitcoin. A lot of the threat actors will ask for other currencies because they are less trackable. Despite what, despite the label on the tin, Bitcoin is extremely trackable. And, And we're now actually seeing law enforcement being able to follow the money essentially through all the tumblers and money washing devices and find the criminals. But in short, yeah, it's Bitcoin how it's paid. The business usually has to pay it up front. We're certainly going to deep dive into that next month about what happens in a an attack and the series around that. But Fee, we did touch on, it's really important. We've only got 10 minutes left. So I really want to illustrate this point is the models. We've got a lot of firms who are in the not-for-profit community sectors, the aged care, the human services. Some of these organizations aren't super big. They don't have big budgets. We've got to help solve this problem regardless. And we've come up with a few different models of how we can attack this. Let's unpack them. Exactly. So I think one of the most important things to realize about cyber security, it is a long-term risk that we've actually got to now incorporate into our strategic governance activity. So we've been talking to quite a few people and getting quite a few ideas and trying to find out what what are some of the models that would match. And David, you've been really helpful with this as well. Thank you. But you talked about actually having seen some examples or models where cyber was added to the risk committee. So added to the terms of risk reference, it was one of the things that that risk committee had to actually pick up and do something about. What happened in those examples? There was a a critical infrastructure organisation I did some consulting with, and they had an amazing incident response plan for kinetic or physical incidents. Yeah. And when we started looking at their digital or cyber response plans, what we actually discovered is that a lot of what they built out for the physical actually overlapped really well with the digital. And Mm -hmm. that's why in that organization, cyber was actually just brought into the risk committee because some of the planning had already been done. We didn't need someone to go off and do it from scratch. There was another 
club that we work with that, again, risk was brought into cyber because they're already dealing with, if we peel it back, information security before cyber security is about physical and digital asset protection. And we're talking cameras and access gateways, and they were very much able to bring that into the risk committee and just, it becomes another type of risk. And some of it is covered by existing aspects. That's good. And another thing, David, that we found really successful when something becomes a top risk is that it needs to become a standing board agenda item. For example, consumer, hearing the consumer's voice at the boardroom table has a whole new understanding and meaning when it actually is a standing item on the board agenda and it forces us to talk about it even if it's a simple conversation it'd be fabulous at a board level to hear a story about cyber to hear Mm. what are we doing or to get one of our partners to come and talk to us about what are they doing it's it's really interesting we also know of some examples and this is on larger organizations where they have identified that they have assets that are really going to be targeted, like very big health organisations that actually have a dedicated cyber subcommittee and they get external experts onto that committee and they even pay them. Just like we pay financial external experts, why not pay cyber experts? Because you can't just in a heartbeat get that expertise onto your board. And last but not least, we've been brainstorming it and as Wes was saying, we. We're running our insight sessions. So on the back of these webinars, you have an opportunity to come on a Tuesday or a Thursday to catch up with us in a really lovely environment online just to talk about how do we handle and what do we do about some of these things. And we're talking about the notion for our smaller, more regional services around shared cyber committees. So what about the role of a large regional organisation actually hosting and setting up with some of their expertise and getting together unusual combinations of partners, not just partnering because you're in health or you're in education, actually cross-pollinating and sharing, sending one of your guys to those committees and coming home with some really good information. We do it with in regional areas around clinical issues and around aged care issues. So why not do it around cyber issues? It would be a really big game changer. I think it's a wonderful way to spread the resources and and get Mm. that activity. I think, Dave, just quickly, you've seen a couple of examples of that I mentioned yesterday. Yeah, Yeah, both in the school and also the clubs I was talking about before, most of those communities and aged care for that matter as well, they usually know each other very well. And I think the other one was domestic violence. We do a lot with those groups. They usually will meet, as Fee said, for various other topics, but I've seen with the schools and the clubs that they do go and they talk about, okay, what are we doing in this aspect for cyber? What tool are you using? Have you got partner recommendations? And I think we just could be doing more collaboration when we're not competing for customers or all those yeah. things. We're trying to compete sorry we're trying to share the love and and uh, raise all the bars absolutely and our audience is not for profit there's no reason why we can't explore some of those models over the next few months we're starting to come to wind down to the top of the hour it is a 60 minute webinar but i think it's really important to talk about a case study where it's real on the ground and a good proportion of our audience is from the aged care sector david so i'm really interested to hear about this story yeah and this is the one we alluded to at the start but essentially it was an aged care business that got hit with ransomware all of their systems were taken offline backups had been encrypted as well the problem they had is that their patient care system was on the servers it wasn't cloud hosted and they basically said to us We've got one or two days before it's going to cause our business major problems. We're not going to be able to print out scripts. That's going to have an impact to our customers. And we have a patient duty of care problem. So unfortunately, the 
the outcome of this is we had to pay the ransom we, and we had to do it in a certain timeline. And we'll go into this in the next section. We didn't have the luxury of being able to negotiate as much as we wanted. Time was against us. And as because all of the forensic data had been locked up, we also had to go and notify all of their customers, all of their next of kin, all those sort of things that this is the sort of information that had been exposed. It was a real impact for a small community aged care facility. Wow. Frightening indeed. Now, we we talked about the high level and the practical things. Just briefly, this is your approach at Solace on how you go through from essentially a little bit like that NIST framework model. Yeah. So we always hear everyone talk about you need to go get a pen test or what's called a penetration test, which is a physical test of your security controls. You can go and spend 35K plus on having someone hack your network and tell you all of the holes you have. But if you leave your front door open, your windows unlocked, all those sort of things wide open, and then you ask someone to break into your house, they're going to succeed. And there's no real value in that except for getting a laundry list of all the problems that you need to fix. So we built this model. Uh, which is more about taking people along a journey or taking businesses along a journey. And the first step is get a gap assessment, get it done by someone external. And that's not because you don't trust your IT team or your IT provider. It's because with all these new regulations coming in, director's liability, et cetera, you need to be able to put hand on heart and know that they are doing the right thing. Or maybe they've been screaming for budget and you didn't understand why, and this will help identify it. And then we walk through this pathway where we implement the basics, we look at response plans, we do a proper assessment after we've done those basics to look for bigger gaps, then run through those simulations. And then finally, when we've done all these things, now we can start talking about a pen test. And obviously, this is a repeatable journey. We don't do it once, we keep going through it. It's more like a loop rather than a squiggly line from A to B. Yeah, my drawing skills weren't that good for this one. <laughs> Very good. Very briefly, Fee, we're, this is just another tool that people can use as part of our deck. We've touched on a lot of these points mm. at, at the moment, but they are the governance tips. Can we just touch on the most important ones as you see it? Well, I think the most important one is, there's a few most important ones, but cyber sits with the board. I think getting your head around these eight areas that we've talked about today. I think, yes, recruit directors with cyber skills, but really recruitment is not necessarily the solution. I think education is really important to David's point. And we're very lucky. Our partners like Governance Institute, for example, have got some fabulous cyber security education that they've just launched today. And where's and I'll make sure the link to that is in our follow-up information for you. It needs to become a strategic pillar. Yeah. It actually, you need to do scenario planning and it actually needs to become a regular agenda item on your board meeting. And I think if you just start each board meeting with a story or something, and even if you combine it with how does it impact on our beautiful consumers, then that it means they're not in competition. Our, com our consumers are not less valuable than cybersecurity. They are the most impacted by cybersecurity. So let's get some stories happening at the boardroom table about cybersecurity impacting on our consumers. Makes for a great story. I guess where's my number one tip is that we actually just start the conversations about it. I just think that... This risk is one the nearly the only risk that can turn the lights out literally overnight from a board organisational level. We manage risks in all areas of the organisations, but this one just cannot be ignored. What we'd like to just touch on are our insight sessions. They, Fee has already mentioned them throughout the call. We do provide deeper insights, deeper data, and it's a real fireside chat. It's literally like this between what we've experienced between the three of us, but with you asking the questions and we, they're really good fun, aren't they, Fee? We had a lot of fun with one of our aged care friends during the week, didn't we? Yes, it's just great. 
because in a webinar, it's very formal and you're all forced to listen to us with your volume and your voice turned off. But we love it when our community, and that means you do not have to be a Govern With client at the moment, just our community yeah. comes and actually says confidentially, it's not videoed or anything, what about this? What do I do about that? And we have our residential expert, Adrian Wagner, who's an IT expert, and we can actually help you answer some questions. And um, yeah, it's a really good thing. So yeah. we really welcome people. And there's a link as to choosing a session to come to in this chat at the moment. Yeah, they're, they're 10 a.m. on a Tuesday or 2 p.m. on a Thursday, trying to give that flexibility for everyone. And they're normally 30 minutes, but if the They never are. Yeah, they they're never are. Never they're, 30 they're, minutes. <laughs> they're, they're always a lot of fun. And we provide some of those low-hanging fruit yeah. solutions because they are easy. You don't need to be a cyber guru to solve some of them. So join us. It's a lot of fun. It's a big takeout. So make sure... It, the URL is there on the screen, governwith.com forward slash insights hyphen session. A lot of fun, but just to wrap up next month, we're going to close the loop on the entire cyber series. We were talking off air two days ago that we, do, we always get a lot of information about the threats and what we need to do, but we don't normally get a lot of information about what to do when it's happened. Now, if we recall from last month's webinar, Michael Parent from Aon was cautioning that it's not a matter of if, it's when it's going to happen, how many times it's going to happen, and how much each incident is going to cost, and whether your ba balance sheet can actually withstand that continuous attack. But there's a lot of things, and we've got the man on today's call, David, joining us again, who sits at the coalface for each one of those. He sees what's happening in Australia, his, his network and his colleagues overseas. So we've got a front row seat to some of the best real life data and information in Australia right now. So make sure you join us next week. We will be sending out a replay of this, hopefully today, certainly by tomorrow. We will be supplying the slides to this as well. And to Fee's point, we'll share the link to the Governance Institute of Australia cyber training as well, if that's appropriate. But most of all, join us on the Insight session. They're just like this. We're talking, we're having fun. They're not recorded. They can go as long as you need. And uh, everyone who attends them always finds them high value from that point of view. So without further ado, we will wrap up. And I'd just like to say an incredibly big thank you to you both. In particular, David, you've brought so much to the table. Yeah. The value prop has been excellent. It's been fun having you. Yeah, it's been amazing, guys. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And as always, Fee, thank you. We love translating the tactical into the practical and what it means for the chairs and the directors out there in our communities, in organisations, big and small. We yeah. want to solve it for everyone, whether you're a prospect, a client, just someone out there in the ether. We talk governance and we want to make a difference in your lives as well. So that's it for today's webinar. Thank you so much for your time and your attention and your attendance. My name is Wes Ward. Bye for now. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, David. See you guys.